Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. We're chatting with Jordan Royburn. We're going to be talking technicals around the gold price, just how much higher gold could go, as well as diving into the underlying gold and silver equities. I want to ask Jordan about GDX and GDXJ. Jordan, let's start off with gold. Boy, oh boy, the run continues. Gold right now trading. Ah, it's still in very high levels here. It threatened to pull back a little bit today, but still on the gold futures market, we are up at over 2300 It challenged 2400 It seems like that upward momentum is continuing. It doesn't really matter what kind of news we see, what kind of other market moves we have. Gold is continuing higher. So, Jordan, are we just going to keep moving higher in gold, or is there going to be some sort of a correction in the near term here? Yeah, hey, Corey, it's possible we could move higher for a little while, but I think that the risk of a, I say a small correction here, not not the big correction I think a lot of people are hoping for. So the risk of that is definitely rising. If you look at silver more so than gold, silver has resistance in the 28th. You know, it, I think it closed a couple times on the daily side at 29. So you look at 2850, 29, there is some resistance there. We've had a really strong move. I mean, silver is trading at 2816 now as we're recording this, but the high today was nearly 2870. And so we've had a really strong move and we're getting very, very close to stiff resistance. And also, if you look at the candles over the last three, four days or so, the daily candles, there's long tails in those and and yes silver has been strong enough that it's been able to close up looks like each of those days but you know after a strong move and you start to get these dojis these wicks on the candles that's a sign that the market is losing some strength and so again even though silver has been able to power higher over the last three or four days the candle action is warning that you know, this is could be losing steam or is starting to lose steam. Now, with respect to gold, I mean, 2350 was one target, 2500 was another. You know, it looks like today we're putting in a bearish candle. And, you know, the two days before today, you, you did have gold rising, but the daily candles were not that encouraging to me. So maybe 2350, maybe that proves to be resistance. And then if we're looking at the stocks as well, Looking at just you know a two or three year chart, looking at support and resistance, GDX, GDXJ, Silge, they're all coming up to an area of resistance. You know, getting back, I think the spring 2023 highs. And if you look at this move that started in the last five or six weeks or so, the miners have, had actually formed a bull flag pattern, and the measured upside target from that is really, really close to those April 23 peaks in GDX, GDX, Jade, Silge. So for all these reasons, at best for the market here, you're probably going to see things slow down and pause for at least a little while. Yeah, Jordan, it looks like whether you look at silver, gold, or the mining equities via the ETFs, a lot of those candles, as you mentioned, kind of had a reversal it makes sense that the sector would take a little bit of pause that refreshes, though, after having such a blistering run higher almost across the board in, the, in both the metals and the mining stocks. But you had also put out a missive to your subscribers earlier this week, and it was more of a big picture vision. And we're getting a lot of questions about, hey, you know, if this thing rolls over, is that the end? And, you know, are we at the end of this rally? And, and you've made the point, and a lot of guests have made the point, that this is just the beginning stages of a longer bull run. So while we've been kind of focused in on the narrow view and the short term, give us that big picture perspective. You know, you'd mentioned gold could get up to 5,000 by 2026. So maybe paint the bigger picture view for those worrying that this is ending already. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I like to hear that, that sentiment, that e even people who are in this space, that there's some disbelief. And I've seen some generalist investors on Twitter and, you know, I've done a few interviews and talking to people, the prevailing sentiment amongst generalists, I would say is yes, gold's broken out. It's going up. I should probably buy more gold, but you know, the stock stock market's still on a secular bull and I'm still, you know, that's still my focus. And so the sentiment is not 
gotten to a point, I mean, obviously it's early, but has it got to that point where allocations from generalists and general retail towards gold and gold stocks are really, really increasing? You know, we haven't seen that yet. So I like where the sentiment is at. You know, really big picture. I mean, we've talked about gold and precious metals not being in a secular bull market yet. I mean, they're getting really, really close. I updated my 60-40 total return data and looking at gold against that, gold's really, it's much closer than I thought, you know, probably three or 4% away in real terms from confirming that. And of course, you have this breakout from a 13-year cup and handle pattern and gold's really exploded in the short term. So it's really hard to look at that and somehow make the case we're not in a new secular bull for gold and precious metals as well. I mean, they'll, they'll follow. So that's the really big picture over the next 10 years is it's incredibly bullish for precious metals. Unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of problems in society that come with that, but we're not quite into that yet. But yeah, looking at now I'm focusing more on the cyclical side of it. And so looking at gold's history and depending on how you measure a lot of the cyclical bull markets, most of them come in around three years. I mean, there there might be one or two that's like you know, two and a half years, could be one or two that's like you know close to four years. But if you're looking at all these cyclical bulls, like they generally more or less, they're around three years. And so, you know, depending on how you measure it, if you measure this cyclical bull from the 22 low, then I would, because the way I measure these past cyclical bulls might be a little different. But what I'm saying is the three years would apply to the October 23 low and not the October 22 low. I mean, four years would apply to the October 22 low. So if we're applying three years, give or take some months, you know, we're looking at the end of 26, potentially as an end to the cyclical bull, end of 26, you know, maybe early 27. And then you have to look at how did gold perform in these cyclical bulls? I mean, the two strongest were the ones in the 70s. Obviously, the moves in the 2000s were more steady. And I think this cyclical move, I mean, it should be bigger than all the ones in the 2000s. Maybe not quite as big as those two in the 70s because they were really gigantic. But if this were to be a 200% bull from the 23 October low, I mean, that's putting it like 5,500, I think something like that. And if you if you look at you, know, you look at the article and video I posted and you just look at the history it's you look at some of these bull analogs like it's totally in line it's not that much of a stress given that we've broken out from a 13 year cup and handle pattern like this is not going to be some quick thing that's going to fade into the night so to speak i mean the the, the risk is that this is going to be much bigger than people think so i could definitely see this gold hitting you know, maybe even 6000 by the end of 26 or early 27 i mean the technicals are there and if you think that this is going to this cyclical bull will be bigger than all the ones we had in the 2000s, then that's what kind of upside you're looking at. And if you look at the fundamentals and you look at the debt situation and the interest on the debt and our debt to GDP, I mean, I'm updating my book right now, writing about that. It, it really supports those technical targets. You know, that doesn't mean you should be a reckless investor here and you know buying super out of the money calls and that sort of thing but you just have to understand that this cyclical bull i mean that there's a much greater risk that this thing's going to hit five or six thousand than it topping out at 2700 or 3000 or 4000 and that's just the way how markets work when you get into a spectacular bull market all the initial upside calls like the market blows that away like people forget how that works Oh, I think we remember it in some of the other sectors that we have seen. It would just be nice of when it is gold's turn and even silver's turn. Let's shift the focus a little bit more into GDX and GDXJ. And I'm not a technician, so I just want to ask you about similarities that we saw from last year at almost exactly the same time as the rally started to where we are right now. You look at GDX right and GDXJ right when it turned into March, the market turned and it went on a run almost from the same level that we were at up to the level that we are now at in the uh, about same period of time. Are there any correlations we can draw to this, Jordan? Does this matter at all that we saw a very similar rally last year as we have this year? I would say not really, Corey. I mean, there's there's a couple things to that. First of all, most people are not 
when they're looking at the miners, they're not taking into account that gold has had this major breakout. You know, you're looking at all this past history of gold miners, but you have to look at, okay, maybe 2005 is comparable because that's a comparable breakout. But even 2009 and that breakout to me is not that great of a comparison to where we are now. So something I said a week or two ago, the way to look at gold stocks, especially after the introduction of gold ETFs in the mid 2000s, is they are an option. They're an option on gold. The miners, that's all they are. Just think of them as an option on gold. And so gold is now the driver. And again, gold has broken out of a 13-year super bullish cup and handle pattern. And so that's going to be the driver. And so if you're making any comparison to the miners today from in the past, it's, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you're just excluding the price of gold, which is the driver. And so when, when you're making these historical comparisons, just like a, a pro tip here is you have to try and align as many factors as you can to make it a really strong comparison. You can't just say, oh, well, this looks like, you know, what happened in 2007 and so we're going to do this. There's many other things you have to consider. Now, the other point is the breadth right now is I haven't updated it yet, but my sense is if I'm remembering this right from my update over the weekend, the breadth now is stronger than it was last year. Like the percentage of GDX and GDXJ and Huey stocks above the 200 day moving average. I mean, that I think that has hit 90% recently and it never got that high in 2023. So we're in a much stronger position now than we were a year ago. Well, Jordan, just pivoting over to the silver stocks, if we look at SILJ or SILJ as you call it, the uh, most speculative side of the precious metals complex, the silver miners, finally got moving because silver finally got moving. And I was noticing on the weekly chart, it finally blasted up above, you know, it's 50 day moving average, 200 day moving average, finally had a nice rally. When you look at the silver mining stocks through SILJ, are you a little more encouraged because it finally got off the mat? I mean, I'm just encouraged by the fact that silver broke above that 26 resistance. And yes, it could come back and do a retest. I mean, there is an open gap there, but you know, and I'm also encouraged by gold and the the fact that this breakout, you've had this really nice move. And so that's, I mean, h- how many months and quarters in last couple of years we're talking about, you know, gold needs to break out, gold needs to break out. So I'm, I'm encouraged that gold is broken out and that silver was able to break above 26. And again, now I could come back and retest that. But yes, it's good to see the silver stocks, especially the, the smaller juniors start to get a lift, but it's not that surprising to me. I mean, they'll follow the silver price. I mean, if the silver price was 25 and a half or 25, 75, you just go back a couple weeks and a lot of these stocks had it moved that much. So they'll, yeah, I mean, if silver continues high, if it breaks 28, 29 and it gets to 34, the silver stocks, they will all continue higher. But at the, I mean, it's encouraging to see the lower quality names, you could say, move. But I think if we get a correction here, that will be a good, uh, like a second chance to to buy into quality. So I'm still favoring quality over the lower quality stuff that hasn't moved as much. Man, damn near everything has around doubled from some of the bottoms. Even the juniors have really started to move just in the last couple of weeks. But Jordan, do you do any comparisons of, let's say, silver to SILJ or gold to GDXJ? Because as you said, these stocks, they should be leveraged to the price. And with prices of the metals breaking out in gold's case, threatening to break out in silver's case, wouldn't you expect some of these ratios to start to favor a little bit more of these stocks as money rallies more into these stocks? Yeah, they definitely will. I mean, with with a lot of these ratios and relationships, especially when it comes to silver, you know, s- silver, thinking about my study of history, gold breaks out first, then silver, you know, takes a couple months or six or eight months. Then once silver breaks out, silver really begins to lead gold. And so, yes, yeah, silver's broken 26, but this is a little different because maybe it needs to break 28, 29 to get a full breakout. And so I suspect whenever that happens, silver breaking 20, 29, that's when you'll really see the leadership from silver against gold and the silver stocks against the gold stocks really accelerate. But 
yeah, I'm happy with the leverage that the silver stocks and the gold juniors and that everything has shown in the last couple of weeks. I mean, they're all like options and options perform best after the underlying security. I mean, you could say gold or say they all perform best after gold makes a major breakout or after gold makes like a really sharp oversold rebound. Gold just made a, a major breakout, as we all know. And, you know, as gold eventually moves higher and higher, you'll see even more more leverage, even greater leverage from the gold stocks. And the same applies to silver. I think when silver breaks above 28 to 29, you'll really see the upside leverage explode in the stocks. Well, Jordan, just to that point, you had mentioned right now, you're still focused on the quality much more so than, let's say, the optionality of some of the juniors. Maybe speak to people about what you mean by quality. And then at what point is it when silver does break that 29 and 30 that it, and it finally takes off that you would feel good getting into more optionality or, or maybe as the uh, famous adage goes, when the sector really takes off, even the turkeys will fly. You know, we'll know that it's really going when some of the worst companies really start outperforming. When do you shift your portfolio from quality to more optionality? Well, one thing is you can find maybe not the highest quality stuff, but stuff that has some quality you can still find really, really good optionality in those types of plays. You know, quality, I mean, we're just, I hate to be so vague, but I'm just looking for value. Things that I have, things that I think have a lot of value at current metals prices. And that obviously would gain significant value at much higher metals prices. So I, I want there to be an element of quality. I'm not just looking for, okay, what's trading at five cents that has the most upside here if gold and silver really blast off. So there has to be some quality to it. And, you know, I think, as I said in the last couple of weeks, I think for gold, focus more on, on junior producers and gold and also developers like the ones that can, that are going to build a mine in the next year or two, the ones that can finance that mine, you know, cause so, the, the CapEx from some of these projects are really astronomical. They're just, they're not going to get financed. Second thing, on the silver side, I mean, there's so few junior producers, like small junior producers that I like. So I'm a little more inclined to look at companies that have a lot of ounces, big deposits, you know, that they're they're economic at, you know, 22 or 23 silver. And, you know, because they have a lot of ounces, you know, there's a lot more upside as the uh, silver bull market, the new silver bull market continues. So look more on the producer side for gold on silver, look more for ounces quality ounces if you can. And I think that those two segments have a lot of optionality. The other thing, and this is really important, size. If you're looking at optionality in the gold space or just anything, three, four, five million ounces, you know, 100,000 ounce production or 150 or 200,000, that stuff has great leverage to a bull market, especially when it starts. You know, and the, and the same goes for silver. But, you know, the, the, you, you have to look at those thresholds. And also cost inflation, I mean, that's a huge problem. So if you have a really good smaller project, like let's say you have, you know, 1.8 or 2 million or 1.5 ounces, it's a really good project. I mean, four years ago, that could work. Now, you know, the all the costs are higher. You know, the CapEx is now a lot higher. So that's also one way to kind of sidestep the cost inflation is you have to make sure that you're dealing with big enough deposits. So I would say that, you know, size is key. If it's not a producer, find something that has that size and is going to be able to get financed. The last thing I would say is, you know, I encourage the listeners to sign up for my premium service. I know I'm tooting my own horn here, but, you know, it's a really inexpensive, affordable service. And, and you want to get more specific answers about what I'm talking about. You know, you can sign up and, get answers, you know, like in a half an hour, basically. You have to follow and subscribe to people who can help you understand that stuff. You know, invest a little bit of your money into getting quality research and information. Oh, it's so true, Jordan. We hear everybody talk about how cheap these stocks are. Oh, there's a big disconnect, but everyone talks so vaguely about it. I'm a numbers guy. Dive into the numbers. See what these ounces in the ground are are priced at you can actually run some numbers around these developers producers and even these explorers that do have ounces in the ground 
look at their market cap, compare them to other projects, and understand that sometimes undervaluation doesn't mean that it's a horrible company. It can mean opportunity for you in an environment where you think that the metals price is going to go much, much higher. Now, again, that is something that you always need to reanalyze because if the prices turn, well, then the investment narrative needs to turn. But if we are really getting to a price where gold doubles from here, even goes higher than that, then a lot of these stocks can fly. And quite frankly, you need to find the ones that have some of the best upside potential that might not already be some of the more higher valued ones as well. But hey, Jordan, we'll post a link to your website. We'll hopefully chat with you again next week. I hope you have a great rest of your week.